Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. And thank you for joining us for our webinar, Effective OKRs, Focusing on Outcomes and Finding Flow. Our presenters today are Task Talk CEO, Dr. McKirsten, and renowned OKR coach, speaker, and author, Felipe Castro. Hello, everyone. I'm thrilled to be uh, doing this with Felipe. I think for so many of us who've been looking at implementing OKRs at our organizations, uh, we've found, Felipe, your work just in, an invaluable resource. I think for a lot of us, uh, Measure What Matters and the earlier resources that we saw got us to a certain point. Uh, we noticed some inconsistencies or some basically some things that made it tricky to apply. And in some cases, just, just uh, uh, the kinds of examples that just insufficient for applying OKRs to really planning at scale and to man managing development, innovation at scale. So I'm just so happy that you're going to present us with uh, a lot of your body of work and how that applies to really managing delivery of software, managing innovation, managing agile, and also avoiding some of the pitfalls, uh, even of, of as, as you've pointed out to me, of words like delivery, right? In the end, we need to focus not on delivering, but, but to focus on driving outcomes. So if you could just uh, advance to the next slide, I'll just give a, a bit of my quick background on this uh, and, and then just uh, blow out the builds on this slide, Philippe. Um, the, my entire uh, research career was around basically understanding software value streams. So understanding how value flows in software delivery. And what I realized early on was that uh, working as a developer, so I, I spent a decade as an open source developer, uh, I, re I realized that the kind of the feedback loop between what I was working on day to day, so the outputs I was producing, the code I was writing, the features I was creating, the, the APIs I was adding, uh, and the outcomes was, was extremely tight. It was almost immediate. I was seeing almost the, the uptake, uh, the daily active usage of features, the API usage and the like, uh, had a very tight feedback loop between myself and my team. And so these methods of agility of DevOps that we were applying back then it was 1999, you know, agility for us was what Ken Beck put out there. Uh, and he was, he spoke about how important the theory of constraints was and how important it was to understand what, what const where the constraint was to getting value to the customer and then feeding that back into your planning your, and your learning process. Uh, but what happened, at least in my case, I think Philippe, this is, you know, you've had some experiences on this as well, is that when those concepts that seem so relatively straightforward of driving outcomes were actually being applied with a basically now two decades of agile and then another decade of DevOps, a lot got lost in translation somehow, right? We, we started seeing uh, things like agile being basically a way of throwing work over the fence to IT teams. And those IT teams working in a silo and being completely disconnected from the customer from outcomes. And with that, Agile somehow morphed into this way of driving more activity, driving more output, uh, rather than driving more for outcomes. I think, Felipe, I, you know, what are you going to tell us here? I think is absolutely key because this, to your point, goes exactly against the, the principles and the nature of OKRs. And we saw similar things with DevOps. Uh, Nicole Forsman and I spent a lot of time trying to understand DevOps metrics and why some of these really important metrics, such as the state of DevOps, the Dora metrics, were actually having people opti optimize their value streams, not for outcomes, but for turning the crank faster for basically getting more releases out there without actually connecting what's in those releases to any customer outcomes. So my own history, basically, I realized from the early days of moving from open source to, to a startup and to this, this, this whole school of thought that came out of Lean Startup, uh, Steve Blank, and then you know, actually went into now the thinking around product management uh, is that you know, we needed more. So I needed myself and my teams to move away from just tracking all delivery through and all outcomes through lean canvases and understanding how those things are connected. Uh, and actually nine years ago, started tracking all of the work at TaskTop through OKRs. So it's been a journey for me. And I think one of the trickiest journeys has to do with a lot of the pitfalls that Philippe is going to present here. So for example, I realized that for us, we needed, while we were trying to look at bottlenecks for getting value to customers, uh, we needed to measure where the bottlenecks were. And as we scaled to many teams and, and, uh, and many developers, as our customers scaled to hundreds and thousands and then tens of thousands of developers, I realized how important it was actually to connect the concepts of flow and where the bottlenecks are to getting faster outcomes to customer and more importantly, to connecting that feedback loop, loop to outcomes. And you'll hear Felipe talk about the importance of that feedback loop. So uh, with that, I think the key thing here is, you know, it's time for us to connect uh, 
multiple schools of thought, right? And I think what, what Philippe is going to do here is he's going to challenge a lot of the agile school of thought and what's evolved into. Uh, it's going to have us think beyond the uh, DevOps and the small, which, by the way, DevOps was not supposed to be. DevOps was supposed to be about flow feedback and continual learning, uh, as, as Gene Kim put forth in the, in the Phoenix project, and really have us think differently and understand OKRs. So now, in terms of why, to me, flow is so important on this, I think as uh, leaders trying to help create the right conditions for our teams, our number one job is improving flow. And this goes back to some of the key principles of Lean and to Goldratt and Gene Kim's here par amazed great paraphrase in the Phoenix Project of Goldratt's, Goldratt's quote that any improvements made beside the bottleneck is an illusion. So if we're trying to drive more outcomes, we need to get the impediments out of our team's way. We need to shorten how quickly we get value, how quickly uh, the activities that we're doing as developers day to day, as teams, as leaders day to day are actually driving value through software and then feeding that back into outcomes. And, and Felipe, you can challenge us on the word value. I, I know that, that that gets overloaded as well, but fundamentally we need to connect our day-to-day -day activity, understand where it's getting stalled and know that if we're measuring the flow uh, in months or weeks, we cannot create this fast feedback loop that drives better and faster outcomes. So with that, Felipe, let's hand it over to you and uh, uh, I'll comment where, uh, where I find things particularly interesting, so. Okay, Mick, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. So the idea is to try to do this more of a conversation, right? So way more interesting for the audience to have a conversation that this, this and me go on and on and on and on. So the first thing we need to understand is that for many decades, organizing around projects used to be accepted. Projects were at the center of how we plan, how we work, okay? uh, but the fact is leaders and employees just can't take that model anymore. It's used to be the VR, but people can't take it anymore. Uh, CEOs are asking, how do I know if the money we invest in projects makes a difference? Especially money invested in technology. At the same time, employees are asking a very similar question. How do I know if my work as an individual contributor of this major enterprise, or even a startup, how do my work makes a difference? People want purpose. People want to make a difference. And the current model is not giving it to them. And it's important to understand where that lack of clarity is coming from. Because in the traditional approach, executives set up high level company or enterprise goals, and then they define a set of projects to achieve those organizational goals, often called strategic initiatives. Uh, and the challenge is, Delivering those projects becomes the goal. And all I have to do is ship the fang, ship the fang, and another fang. And although many organizations say, yeah, we are agile, but in the end, they're falling into the oldest model possible, which is somebody does a business case full of promises of all the benefits we'll get if we just invest in this fang, it gets approved. Then we work several months, 12 months, 18 months on that fang, and we launch it. But there's a question missing. How can we achieve all the outcomes we promised in the business case, all those wonderful facts? And more often than not, organizations don't measure that, especially not at the project level. Sometimes they measure at very, very high level. Right? But we don't measure if that specific project worked. And some people will say, oh, but they did a business case. And I love this quote from Scott Cook, Cook founder of Intuit. For every one of our failures, we had spreadsheets that look awesome. And every single senior executive knows this by heart. Yeah. If you look at every single major failure in any organization, every one of them had an awesome looking spreadsheet. Right? And so organizations are left in a situation, paraphrasing John Wanamaker, half the money I spend on projects is wasted. The trouble is I don't know which half. So everyone knows not every project works, nobody knows which. So the fact that is that being on time, on scope and on budget is not enough anymore. We evolved, we're way more uh, mature than that right now. We have better tools. So as a joke, I like to say goodbye projects, hello outcomes. Okay? Uh, and Marty Kagan, uh, my mentor and is, uh, on Silicon Valley Product Group is the thought leader on, on 
managing that product. We were discussing this last year, and he told me a, a quote that I had to, I have to mention it all the time. He said, we all know that we do things and that some of those things make a difference while some do not. The outcomes approach is about focusing on the difference we're trying to make and not losing sight of it. That's basically it. <laughs> okay, that's everything I'm going to say in a single slide. Okay, but let's understand this in more detail. The first thing is that focusing on outcomes helps solve the missing middle. Because if you look at the traditional approach, there's the middle part is missing. There's a gap between the day-to-day -day work of the teams and the company or enterprise level goals. So the way we solve this is with a simple tool called the outcome tree, where the idea is we understand the relationship between different metrics, and then it's outcomes all the way down. So all the way to individual contributor, we have a, an outcome that's linked, contributes all the way up to the company goals, right? So it's simple in, con in concept. In real life, of course, it's way harder. So let me show you an intentionally simple example of an outcome tree. Okay. So imagine you have a, an SEO team and they have two metrics. One of them is increasing time of pay on page because they believe based on lots of evidence that will help increase the share of Google search traffic and in the percentage of the traffic that goes to your website. And they're working on this because they believe will help increase the number of qualified leads, which then will help increase the number of subscribers. Think about a subscription software like Zoom, and then eventually all the way up to the company, increasing the total number of subscribers. So that's a very simple example of the outcome tree. It's just a branch. It's real life. It's way more complicated than that, of course, but that's the idea. We should connect the work of a team all the way up to the business unit, right? So OKR should ladder up to the company goals. The big challenge we have is that our brains are wired to think about activities. We have lots of scientific evidence around that. And the challenge is that we often don't check if they work. I love this slide from John Cutler. Uh, if you think about any Kanban board on, on the planet, it stops at done. So we, uh, even our, process, our way, ways of working tend to believe that, yeah, we just have to do things. Hey, but how do we know if they work? And the question I always like to ask folks is, if you deliver all your activities and nothing improves, are you successful? I hope you agree you're not. So to find that tendency, the natural tendency we have to think about activities, we use outcome planning, which is a business philosophy where we deliberately focus on outcomes. Outcome planning focuses on what we want to achieve and why. And Stephen Covey had the, the crisp definition of outcome planning, begin with the end in mind. So the idea is when you begin with the end in mind, you start by agreeing on what we want to achieve and why that's important. Only after you agree on what we want to achieve and why, then you start to think about, hey, how are we going to get there? So then you never lose sight of what you want to achieve and what that's important. That's the core of the whole thing. So one way to understand the difference is imagine we ask the same question for two different teams. Right? What are you working on and why? So you ask that question to the first team and they basically going to say, we're doing this because the stakeholders that told us important, we're done when they are okay with that. If you ask the same question to a second team and they give you a completely different answer, right? So this second team is a team that understands what they're trying to achieve, why that's important, and they define success not by shipping things, but by moving a small set of selected metrics. So this difference is key. And what we want to do in this, in this presentation is help position shift from the old way thinking about projects, shipping things, where projects are the center, to outcomes, a new way, where again, we never lose sight of what we want to achieve. And 
many organizations fail, struggle with this shift. And one of the main reasons this happened is due to what I call the Tinkerbell approach. In the Tinkerbell approach, you take an organization that's using traditional ways of working and you simply sprinkle the new thing on top of it. It can be OKR, it can be Agile, it can be Outcomes. Just sprinkle on top of it and believe that if you think happy thoughts, you're going to fly away and become Google, right? Of course, uh, that never happens, right? That never works. And because we have a big tendency of picking a new tool and forcing it to fit our old habits instead of changing the habits to fit the new possibilities brought by new tools. And Nick, do you see this happening a lot? What if I do? I do. And Philippe, I, I just want to go back one slide because I think it's a visual I want us to all take away. You know, the, one of the main things I've seen over the last, really over the course of this year, is whereas OKR is being, you know, they've been adopted in technology companies and startups for, you know, like ours, but the better part of a decade now, you know, with basically based off the work at Intel, then moving on to Google. Uh, in the past six to nine months, I've seen more adoption of OKRs at enterprise IT levels, enterprise technology levels than ever before. And this, I think, is one of the biggest dangers and where we need to listen you know, very closely to Felipe because it's, it's how we fell into these agile dysfunctions. It's how we fell into basically putting in scaled agile frameworks with nothing changing in terms of the way that the business work is planned and the same silos remaining. So of course, you know, one of my goals with the flow framework was actually to connect these two things and just to point out, we can't have OKRs as being this, you know, the, this planning exercise that's completely disconnected from day-to-day -day teams, doesn't connect the teams to outcomes, and then in the end just becomes this, this new way of doing waterfall planning. So I think this is, this is such a key point, Felipe, and that, yeah, if, if you could continue, it's, it is one of the main dysfunctions that I'm seeing is this Tinkerbell approach of, of, OK, of sprinkling OKRs and not moving at all from tracking activities and outputs. Yeah, it's basically you continue to work the same way you always did and just call it OKR, right? Yeah. So again, the tendency we have of just taking whatever the new thing is and hey, yeah, just put it on top of whatever you're doing before. Right? And OKR was created in Silicon Valley. It comes from the modern product management approach, right? which is totally different than the way most teams work and most uh, organizations work. And, and the closer you are, to the modern product management model, the easier it is to adopt OKR. The converse is also true. The farther away you are, the harder it is. So it's a journey, and different teams will be in different steps of that journey. So to avoid the Tinkerbell approach, we need to unlearn. And I love this definition of unlearning that comes from my friend Barry O'Reilly. Barry defines unlearning as the process of to move away from mindsets and behaviors that were effective in the past, but now limit our success. So unlearning is key because there are practices, mental models, business tools that were useful in the past, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or even before that, but now are limiting our success. So for the remainder of the presentation, we'll be talking about seven big things that we need to unlearn to focus on outcomes. Okay. It's starting with the first one. Thinking that OKR is a silver bullet. Right? I just have to do this and everything will magically work. So the first big problem is that there's a lot of bad advice online about OKR, and especially lots and lots of bad examples. And this is, of course, a joke where Abraham Lincoln says, if there's an example on the internet, it must be true. But that's how many, many people react to OKR. Okay, they just do a Google search and they believe everything on the internet is amazing, yeah. So uh, people on the internet can even agree that the earth is round. Why do you think they're going to agree what a great OKR okay looks like? There's a lot of bad advice out there. But Felipe, uh, you've, as you've pointed out in your, I think, in your commentary on the Measure What Matters book, actually there, there's a deeper problem that I think a lot of people have inherited, which I think you know, you've helped us, you've helped others uh, shift away from, is that the Measure of What Matters book, book, actually more than half of the examples in it, and this struck me when I was reading it, I just didn't quite comprehend it till I read your, your critique of it. Uh, while there's a lot of good visionary 
stuff in there, uh, more than half of the examples in that book are actually more output uh, oriented than outcome oriented. And I think they've actually fed all of these bad Google search results that people are building and using in terms of how they plan their OKRs. Yeah, definitely. The, the, I wrote a whole, a whole uh, uh, review of the book. We can link to it. But definitely, uh, the stories in the measurement mirrors are amazing. The examples are awful. So I have mixed feelings, to say the least, about the book. Right? It's a love, I have a love-hate relationship with, definitely, with, with measurement mirrors. So years ago, when I started talking about OKR, I only taught people about OKR, and then people, some people didn't get it. And then I started talking about outcomes on the side. But now, completely, it's the opposite, right? It's outcomes with a little bit of OKR on the side, because OKR is just a tool to help you focus on outcomes. Unless you believe that, unless you understand that, you get very little or no result from OKR at all, okay? So they're just the tool to help you focus on outcomes. Uh, the second thing that we need to learn is the idea that we can measure value air quotes. So, Value is very useful as a high-level concept, but by definition, it's fuzzy, open to interpretation. It's very hard to measure. People have different understandings of it. And when applied to, to Agile, there's a hidden assumption behind it, which is that uh, stakeholders can tell us which org items have value. If I want to know what's valuable, just ask a stakeholder. And that's a completely flawed assumption, right? Because value is like a joke. You don't get to say if your joke is funny. The audience tells you if your joke is funny. If the audience is not laughing, you change the joke. The same thing with software or product. If the audience is, doesn't feel, find that your software is valuable, you change the software. So asking stakeholders for their opinion, hey, is this valuable? It's a terrible indicator of success, and it's a trap that many, many teams fall into. And Mick, have you seen this in your work? What do you think? Yeah, so absolutely. And I know as we were scaling up a task up, we were applying some of those agile best practices of those times of trying to specifically assign value to every single feature user story effectively at some point work item, right? So everyone would have to have a mini business case. And it's it's just back to that John Cut Cutler slide, right? It's the, the that's actually never properly measured. And I got to realizing that it was actually it was almost nearly impossible to measure is how a single set of activities of outputs of code of features would actually drive a customer outcome. So I realized we needed to shift away from this. And of course, we still you know, find a good practice to specify cus you know, customer outcomes on specific work items so that everyone working on that is, is able to better understand that and at a more fine green level than a, a, a broader OKR uh, and a broader outcome. But we've realized that, that that's not what we, we managed to. So again, the shift with the flow framework was to say, okay, every single product value stream, and you know, we're still calling them product value streams, uh, Maybe one day shifting to probably outcome streams, but you know, value stream management has, has, has taken hold. But fundamentally, it's all about the outcomes that the value that, that are being delivered on the value stream. So instead of actually measuring the individual work items, let's make sure that every single product value stream, we know what the customer is, we have outcome metrics for that customer. And we know that all of these activities that every single person is doing day to day and really driving to, A, as you said, Felipe, they know why they're doing it because those outcomes are specified. But we also know that in aggregate, those things are actually helping drive those outcomes. And the most important thing that we learned there is not to actually measure uh, initially how much and what's flowing, but actually the speed of that feedback loop. So when we can touch on this at a later point, but I realized that the importance of shortening that time to feedback to customer outcome back into planning is, is the number one thing. And that's always been the number one recommendation uh, of the flow you know, that I've been giving on the flow frame is just shorten that feedback cycle, shorten that flow time in order to, to get uh, it, to understand whether you're driving to that outcome as quickly as you can. And I think as, as you're about to show us, Felipe. So. Yeah. So, so the idea is that nobody can predict what you work or not. Right? So asking someone inside your company, hey, is that, does this add value or not? And uh, I'm looking at the, the chat here, and somebody say, "Are the stakeholder the customer?" That's one of the problems with traditional agile, because when agile was created 20 years ago, 
IT was there to serve the business, right? So the customer was, whenever I say customer, I'll say the actual customer, right? The end customer, right? We can never forget them, right? So uh, the idea is, yes, you can still talk about value streams. Talking about value at a high level concept is totally fine. The what we need to learn is trying to measure this high level concept. So instead of you trying to measure value, uh, outcome planning brings a precise and actionable language. Just uh, ensuring everyone uses the same language is key. So in outcome planning, there's a clear definition of an outcome. That's a term of art, meaning that's the, the definition we use, right? Has a specific meaning. So the idea is that we define outcomes are as the measurable beneficial effects you want to create, either for your customers, your company, or for your employees. Because I may be working at a platform team or a few team that's generated a tool for another developer team, and that's totally fine. So what's the measurable beneficial effect you want to create? What's the difference we, we want to make? And that's the definition we'll be using, right? So the first big distinction we need to make is between the outcome, like the measurable beneficial effect you want to create, and an activity. Activity is the big umbrella term for everything that you do. Projects, programs, initiatives, tasks, actions, epics, user stories, whatever. Everything that you do falls under the big umbrella term activity. And an outcome is, if we, this works, you're successful, then you create that measurable beneficial effect. We can only be measured after the fact, right? You can only measure if you are actually using. So the third thing we need to unlearn is the idea of assigning projects to teams. And I love this, this quote from Ed Moria, right? Love the problem, not your solution. Life too short to build something nobody wants. So the idea is nobody can know what's going to work or not. So instead of falling in love with a specific idea, specific solution, fall in love with what you're trying to achieve. So it's a good introduction to the big difference between the old way and the new way of working. In the old way, companies and executives would assign solutions to the teams or activities to deliver. In the new way, you will assign problems to solve. Some people don't like the term problem, so we're talking about opportunities and problems, right? So because the people don't like that. And it's important to understand that when I say solution, I'm talking about a specific design implementation, I'm talking about a specific solution or a list of requirements, meaning, hey, you have to do exactly this. In the new way, instead of giving that specific list of requirements, specific design, we give teams a customer or business need to address. So after they understand the customer need or the business need they need to address, they have autonomy on the how, right? They just, they can iterate and find, figure out what works. And a big, change is required is that organizations stop funding scope and start funding teams. So instead of funding, hey, I have to ship those things, hey, how many teams should we assign to this opportunity? If it's a big opportunity, maybe we need to assign more than one team to it, right? And then we can just do the three to link to the work of each team to the high level opportunity. But that's a big shift that needs to happen as part of this. So, now we can talk a little bit about OKR, finally. Right? So let's see a, a, an example of an OKR. So the objective describes the opportunity or problem you're trying to address. Okay? In this case, make it easy for people to get a COVID-19 vaccine. And the key results, they describe the outcomes you want to achieve. And then you can see right, in this specific example here, what would be the, the key result. But, but since our brains are wired to think about activities, we have to learn how to manage separate buckets. So it's very important that we learn how to manage separate buckets. So in one bucket, you put your objective, and the second one, you put your key results, and the third one, your activities, what are you going to do? Because unless you learn to manage those separate buckets, our brains are going to think about activities and you end up with a big, massive total list, list of deliverables. So here in this table, we have some examples of key results on the left and activities on the right, right? 
So this is just a quick uh, example of things that are results and things that are. And what's very important is that activities are not bad by any means. I'm not saying you, you should stop thinking about them, right? The challenge is stop thinking about project at the center of everything. We need to be able to manage both outcomes and activities each at the right time. And that's why the flow framework managing flow is so important. Let's get things done. It's really, really important. Thing is, not every single thing you do work, right? Like that's that's why the flow, thinking of flow and managing flow is so important, right? Yeah, and Felipe, can you go back to the buckets? I, I just want to underscore this point because I think this is where some of the I think you know you're making it very clearly here. I think this is where so much of the confusion comes from. Now, I, I quickly will get to the questions in the chat at the end, but I quickly saw a question in the chat: is you know why is it that OKRs so often fail uh, within middle layers of management, right? When you think of that outcome tree, and I. I I've, I've seen this happen frequently, and I actually think it's misunderstanding and mi misapplying buckets. Felipe, you quickly touched on actually, sometimes the customer that we're driving outcomes for might be an internal customer, right? You might be, you might be delivering a, a new internal system. You might be building a new developer platform. Uh, and then you will have activities that you do, such as implementing a large set of APIs or, or a new analytics pipeline. Uh, but if you don't separate the activities of doing that, with the outcomes for that, which is let's say making every single one of the customer-facing products uh, have you know have the proper access to insights and customer data, and that driving an actual back and you know going back up the outcome tree, uh, that driving uh, you know uh, result in terms of market share or in terms of customer satisfaction or in terms of retention and the like, uh, this is where things fall down. So I think one of the most I think in Philippe from 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 your work here, one of the, I think one of the most important things to take away is that we, we do work day to day. We've got people listening here who work on those activities, right? We need to uh, you know make our daily work, and this is one of the most important things things about the DevOps movement, which is we need to continually improve our ability to deliver, right? What's happening for so many organizations is that they basically, a team creates, uh, let's say that new API, and then it takes six months to actually get into production. So there's no feedback loop and you have no idea whether you, the activity that you did and that thing that you stayed up very late or over the weekend doing actually drove a key result that was meaningful to your management, to your leadership, and fundamentally to the, to the business and to your customer. So I think this is such a key point is separating these things out and making sure you know, activities are there, but and that was really the point of connecting flow to, to the business outcomes is that every single activity that we take can actually measure, basically we can measure uh, a result from, so. Yeah, definitely. And the example you gave is, is perfect because that's the uh, an example of the lack of purpose because hey, I've worked on this thing for months and then it's been six months and it's not in production yet. Uh, when we work with enterprise uh, uh, clients, it's common that they say, hey, we are losing talented engineers. But they complain, hey, I can never ship anything. Nothing goes in production. I'm here for six months and I never ship a single thing. I'm still waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. That's definitely the powers of having short feedback loops. Right? So another thing, the number four on things we need to unlearn is the idea that our job is to ship deliver more, to ship more stuff. And Marista Meyer, former VP of product from Google, has some great advice, which is not a key result unless as a number, right? And by the way, if you go to measure matters, I check the data, 53% of key results at measure matters don't have a number, even though the book quotes Marissa Meyer. So it's weird. John Doerr is the guy who actually taught Marissa OPR. So it's a weird book. So again, it's not a key result unless it has a number, okay? But don't let it fool you. Many people are fooled by that. All key results have numbers, but not everything that has a number is a key result. Because we tend to measure what's easy, what we have always measured, what others are measuring. And that's something that you discuss even in your book, right? Nick, you talk about measuring the whole things, yeah, this, and this is this then this goes back to the to the Tinkerbell and sprinkling OKRs that, and the entire problem is that what we're seeing is OKRs deployed over existing silos. So again, if all business planning happens up front, the OKRs are all defined. They completely ignore the capacity of the teams. Uh, they completely ignore any feedback cycle, and everything's orchestrated around you know basically annual cycles. It it just doesn't work. But I think the interesting thing about this point, Felipe, is that 
what happens then is the silos are what gets measured because the silos become easy to measure. And so how long it takes, and this is one of the main failures I see, one of the main metrics becomes how long it takes uh, agile teams, development teams to finish a user story, a work item. That, that becomes the whole metric, right? That's, that's what IT is at that point measured to, how many story points they complete. That's one of the most common metrics we see out there and it tells us nothing about outcome. However, it's easy to measure because you just look in Jira or you look in Azure DevOps or whatever tool you're using in GitHub and it's easy to measure. Uh, pull request, it's actually the same thing. And so we have so much based on just measuring those, those simple metrics, but they're not about these these end-to-end -end outcomes. And and that's actually been you know part, part of the challenges with the DevOps metrics as well, right? If you're only measuring uh, the delivery pipeline, how long it takes to ship code, you're you're measuring what's easy. In some cases, it's very important to measure it because if you have a bottleneck there, well, you need to relieve that bottleneck. You've got frustrated developers quitting because they can actually have a, an effective pipeline that allows them to drive outcomes elsewhere more quickly, uh, as you pointed out, Felipe. But, but it's not the thing that you should be measuring. So I think, again, this comes back to, and th th this is a, it's, I do want to say at scale, when you've got those silos in place, uh, it's, it can be, it, it's harder to measure end to end. It's harder to measure outcomes. It's harder to give outcomes. Uh, uh, to quantify them with a number, but I think it's just as critical. And I think to me, and Philippe, I'd love to hear your commentary on this, uh, uh, OKRs are an opportunity to actually blow away old ways of measuring things, to step away from your KPIs, keep them, keep all your telemetry, your DevOps, your pipeline telemetry, keep your, you know, keep your story point velocities if you want to, um, but, but move away from that being the way that you manage and you plan and and, and you measure the company and the way that you connect, connect people to the mission. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say that measuring outcomes is hard at scale. I think that uh, traditional enterprises have an org structure that makes it harder to measure uh, yeah. outcomes. So because Google, Amazon, they are all able to measure yep. outcomes at a massive scale because the team topology is different, the structure is different, the way they're organized yep. is different. Right? So again, we tend to measure what's easy. In measuring quantity, it's easy. So we often fall on the trap of measuring outputs. The dictionary definition of output is the amount of something produced, measuring the quantity of things, how many things you produce. And here are some examples of outputs, right? Here on the screen. So I'm just counting how many things I ship. It's always shipping more stuff. And what, what, what if nobody's using that? What if it's not working? So we don't care about the quantity that we ship, the outputs, we care about the outcomes, right? So activities are what you do, Outputs are how many activities you ship. And outcomes are, hey, the measure beneficial facts created by what you did, right? So those concepts are, because measuring output is a very, very common mistake. When you tell people to set measurable goals, we tend to measure quantity, we tend to measure outputs. And the big question is, is your job to deliver more or to make a difference? If you ship a gazillion points and nobody here, somebody uses them, so what, okay? And I want to ask the, the audience to think about it for a minute. How many metrics or concepts in Agile focus on outputs? Can you name one? Can you think about it? How many metrics or concepts in Agile focus on outputs? I guess you must be thinking about a few of them. So that's why number five in the things we need to learn is output Agile. Output Agile is the idea of shipping more stuff is what Agile is for. And it's represented by the title of Jeff Sutherland's book, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time. Our goal is to always ship more software. No, it's not. Right? It's about delivering value to software. Maybe less software is what we need. Right? And it's very important to understand this. I'm not talking about unlearning Agile or unlearning Scrum. It's about unlearning output agile. And as part of that output agile, which was something from 20 years ago that made sense and doesn't make sense anymore, uh, there's this quote from uh, Ron Jeffries, right? He says that choosing the right things to make is of course massively important. Agile is intentionally about the making, not the choosing. Because the idea was that separation between the business and the team and the business told us what to do and we just did it. So output agile intentionally follows the order taker model where the team are there just to do whatever the stakeholder says, right? We have moved beyond that. That's not how 
high performance teams work anymore. So we need to unlearn this. Again, it's not a learning agile, it's not a learning output agile. And one of the things that we need to learn is one of the principles of the manifesto, right? So number seven, working software is a primary measure of progress. Is it bad for you not, right? So outcomes are the primary measure of progress. And the big question and big challenge is that velocity in the wrong direction is waste. Shipping lots and lots of points that nobody cares is just waste. Right, so take a lean approach, that's definitely not what you want. So that's definitely something that you need to be very, very concerned if you're measuring those thing and using that as a main metric, right? Uh, and Nick, what do you think about this one? Yeah, so, you know, obviously completely agree, but I think that the hard part, and it's, it's kind of back to what you said at the start, Philippe, right? OKRs came from organizations that were born digital, uh, that were aligned to customers and to products and they were structured in this way. And I think they are this massive opportunity for organizations that are still structured in more traditional ways with silos, with handoffs, with throwing work over the fence to, to IT and to technologies to, to unlearn all of that and actually change the structure and the dynamics of the organization. So I, I do wanna make a, an interesting comment here, right? Because you know, take flow time. We, I, I often say flow time is the, the main thing to optimize for because what's, what it, if, if you're optimizing for flow time, uh, you're actually able to create a faster feedback loop. However, if you, you're optimizing for flow time and there's no feedback loop to an outcome to a key result that you're measuring, even optimizing for flow time is useless, right? Because you could, again, you could just get into doing more waste faster. And the amount of waste that we've actually empirically measured in organizations' value streams in terms of work that gets done and either gets canceled late or does not drive an outcome is well over 50% for, for you know, it's, this is not statistically, statistically significant data sets yet, but basically on, on fairly large data sets, we're seeing that waste in over 50% in almost every enterprise organizations that we've measured. So I think, again, this speaks to the fact that even flow is meaningless and measuring flow unless it's measured by an outcome metric. That said, of course, I think in some cases, because things are so bad in some of these organizations and that six month story, actually having a key result of reducing flow time can again, help you accelerate how quickly you get feedback on, on the actual outcome metric. Yes, definitely. And, and, and that's something that, right. that, number six number that we need to learn is long feedback loops. And we get you yeah. to flow time, lead time. So we need to unlearn this idea that we can work with, with uh, long feedback loops. And there's a great analogy, which is to think that in the old way, we, organizations, they try to be the wedding cake every 12 months, 18 months. So you do a plan, business case, and then you spend 12 months building a big wedding cake. Uh, in the new way, teams, they try to sell a cupcake every week or so. Right? So it's always learning with short feedback loop, the idea that you described in your experience where we are learning fast, there's fast feedback, we're putting something in the hands of a customer and learning from it. So it's completely different because you course correct, course correct and you adjust. So you learn and you test different versions of the cupcake with different frostings, different hypotheses, you test different hypotheses, you test it with real evidence and you course correct and you eventually get to that big uh, wedding cake. So flow enables experimentation. So uh, it's important to understand that output metrics, they measure quantity, right? the amount of something produced. Lead time, flow time doesn't measure that. It's how long it takes for a single thing, right? And reducing flow time enables experimentation. A very common issue when I work with large traditional enterprises is that the team reach out to me and say, yeah, we love it, everything, but hey, our lead time is 100 days. Yeah. How can I, how can I uh, achieve an outcome in a quarter? You can't. So that's a major thing that you need to address. And we see several organizations trying to address, reduce shorten the lead time, right? So it's important not to compare, right? But measuring that, for example, the number of teams that have over say seven days of lead time and trying to reduce the number of teams to that, it's a great result for many organizations, right? Because this will in short feedback loops and neighbor experimentation, this can completely change the organization 
right? Uh, right? So that's a powerful enabler, right? Not every single team needs this, because if you're already at I don't know, one day or sometimes hours, right, of, uh, of lead time, you definitely don't need that key result, but it's a very powerful enabler for the vast majority of organizations. Let's see. And you're the expert, right? Or on flow, so. Well, yeah, it's, I think this, I, I have not articulated this point that this simply, right? I think this is so powerful. You can't expect to have a successful OKR deployment at your organization if your feedback loop, as measured by your flow timer and, and, and as well as lead time, uh, is, is over the span of a quarter. And this is why, again, we're, we're seeing success where it's, if you measure your flow time in days, you're actually going to get the kind of feedback that are going to make OKRs effective. If you don't, and Felipe, I think maybe some of the dysfunction I'm seeing actually is because there isn't that feedback on outcomes. It causes leadership at various levels to actually fall back into tracking activities and outputs because again, they're not driving outcomes. They're, 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 the, the flow is just too slow to drive outcomes. So the, and you just remind me of a thing I think that's so key and such a big opportunity for organizations as Felipe, as, as, you know, as you just pointed out, shortening that feedback loop is key. You've got your transformation teams that's powering your digital transformations. You've got your ways of working team. Uh, make that measurable, make, make shortening. I, I think it's so important. I'm only seeing this in pockets where the actual ways of working in transformation teams are using OKRs themselves or helping the, the development teams use OKRs as well. So make that measurable, make, make that an OKR. And I found that so powerful is cutting your flow time in half to get that feedback loop and making sure you've got a effective feedback is absolutely critical. And again, OKRs are, are, are a very powerful tool as long, as long as they're outcome driven. And as long as we realize that that, that alone is not an outcome. Shortening the feedback loop is just a, a necessary condition to drive this kind of outcome and feedback cycle. Oh, definitely. If you want to work like Google, like Amazon, and you have a 100 day uh, uh, lead time, forget it. That's the first thing you need to address. And, yeah. and one thing that I, that I loved about uh, your, your book and work is that, that we need to measure end to end lead time because we see many, many organizations work, they measure in radically different ways. There's no standard, teams don't know how to measure it. They measure only their step in the, in the, the value stream. So uh, they never measure end to end. So that's a very, very uh, important concept. Um, so we are kind of running out of time here. So the number seven on the list of things we need to learn, that's a deeper one. It's just the whole IT model, right? Uh, there's a reason the teams at Google, Amazon, Facebook, they're not called IT, they're called engineering because they abandoned the IT model many years ago, right? Silicon Valley doesn't use that term. I don't think they ever used it, right? Because there's a big gap between the IT model and this modern product management uh, approach. And the source again is, is Marty, Marty Kagan, where while the IT model teams exist to serve the business, in the modern product management model, teams that think exist to serve the customers in ways that meet the needs of the business. And there's a huge uh, gap between the two, right? And so, to be able to use OKR, you need to, be to move closer and closer to the modern product team model, right? And I definitely recommend Marty's work on it. So just as a wrap up, so the seven things uh, we need to learn, OKR as a silver bullet, measuring value, projects assigned to teams, our job is to deliver more, uh, output agile, long feedback loops, and the whole IT model, right? So Mick, over to you. Yeah, I'll just quickly wrap up because I think there have been some great questions and I'm looking at them now, like Radia's question, I want to get to very quickly here, but uh, you know, so to learn more about the Flow Framework, just go to flowframework.org. We've got the Flow Institute. I think the body of work around connecting this to OKRs and, and Felipe's great work is, is forming quickly. Uh, and I think, again, the, the whole point here is that this can be a great catalyst for, shif for shifting away from that, from that IT model. So, Radia, to, to get at your question, I think this is just as relevant to non-software com companies whose core business is not software, right? Companies who are travel companies or healthcare companies or, or government agencies. I think we know that this is a model that drives innovation, drives fast feedback, and this is the model that's needed in this, in this age of software and digital. So I think, I think it very much applies. And uh, Felipe, if you just go to the next, uh, the next slide, um, 
uh, and then let's let's just jump into questions and let the questions run till the end. So we'd love to again, as as I think the entire community and as really these different schools of thoughts of people trying to do all that good work on agile on DevOps, but really connect that to business outcomes where we know if those business outcomes are limited to to the IT team, it's it's just it's not going to happen. We have to actually break through that ceiling. We have to change the organization structure and dynamics. Uh, you know, please join us on this conversation. Where again, I think we're seeing OKRs as just a very timely enabler of just of completely shifting and changing these ways of working, these ways of measuring and and driving for innovation. So uh, with that. Uh, Laurel, there have been so many questions. Uh, I guess good luck curating them for, for Philippe and I. <laughs> I tried to note a couple, but but we can follow up on more on, on Slack as well. So, Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. And we did get an overwhelming amount of questions that we won't be able to get to all of them today. Please join the Flow River community. We have an OKRs channel and be following up with questions there. If we don't get with your question today, we'll also be following up via email. Uh, one of the first questions I have is, I've seen several organizations let departments or silos drop their own OKRs. Then at a company plan event, these are presented and put together on the global plan, even though it's really important to have teams own these OKRs. This tends to lead to a chicken or egg discussion about who should act for C-level, middle management, or teams of teams. Any thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, it's it's... The thing is, the idea is that uh, leaders, they start with intent, what we want to achieve, right? So a simple way to think about it, uh, leaders think about what's the opportunity of problem we want to address, right? And they explain the concept to the teams, the team federal OKRs, and come back to it. So if you're working on a team of teams model, usually you have two layers of OKRs. You have both team level OKRs and team of team level OKRs. If you use a Spotify thing, you have squad level OKRs and tribe level, level OKRs, right? Uh, but it's important it's a bi-directional conversation. It's either 100% top-down or 100% bottom-up. Leaders set priorities with input from the teams. They define the opportunities we want to address, explain the context to the teams, team fair OKRs, and present it back. There's a back and forth. That's crucial. Another question we have is one of the challenges while pushing our teams to think in terms of outcomes is that we are not prepared with the data um, or systems missing, or the skill in the team to decide the outcomes or impact correctly. What we observed is that in the absence of that, we just get into indecision and everything goes into a debate about what's the actual impact here. Um, any thoughts on stopping this indecision given we agree about thinking in outcomes but don't have the right way to? Yeah, and Philippe, I wanna augment this with another question that came from Rupa, right? Is that, you know, uh, the question was, can because I, what, what I see is often in the absence of having that measurable and having that feedback, having the systems to do it, uh, things do fall back to qualitative met KRs. So yeah, how do you help organizations kind of get out of that, that deadlock or snapping back again to, to tracking activities? Yeah. So yeah. So first of all, adopt okay is a journey. Right? So one of the most powerful things that I teach is that people say is liberating is that OKRs can be imperfect and more they will be imperfect in the beginning. Yeah. So that is you improve over time. Uh, setting qualitative OKRs means nothing. So <laughs> the whole idea is how we measure it. It's what's the outcome. So you just keep yourself off the hook. But one of the core part of learning how to use OKR is teaching people how to create new indicators, how creating metrics for things they never measured before. That's definitely part of the journey. And that has to be part of the toolkit of any team. So one of the big difference between a, a, a product team and a traditional IT or delivery team is that a modern product team has instrumented the product. So they measure the features. They don't ship things without uh, being instrumented because how on earth are you going to measure? So why would you launch something that you can't measure? And know, how would you have that feedback loop without instrumentation? So invest in instrumentation, that's a given. But yeah, you have to instrument what, what, you, what you ship. And learning how to create new metrics is core. Right? And then over time, you learn more about the problem you're trying to address, and you develop the capability of measuring more stuff. Right? So that's always part of the journey. Okay? Uh, and I've never worked with a single team, hey, we measure everything we need. That doesn't exist. Even at Google, even at Amazon, that doesn't exist. Right? There's always things that you could measure. 
Yeah, I mean, Philippe, my frustration here is often is that you know, the teams that I know, I'm sure you see some of this as well, that the teams are overloaded, right? Their, their flow load, their work in progress is extremely high. They're, they're being measured to, again, how much they're delivering and when. And w that's happening with an abs absence of ways of measuring outcomes. So to your point previously that, you know, if half of what you're delivering is wasted, half the projects, half the features, uh, if you have no way of measuring that, the most urgent thing for you to do is to implement a way of measuring outcomes, right? And a way of measuring outcomes that, that everyone on, the, on every team and every team of teams can, can relate to and can prioritize around and, and can work towards. So I think I know if you could just comment on that briefly, but, but my view on this is there is nothing more urgent to do than to actually make sure that, that this is measurable because otherwise just the, the amount of uh, creativity and capital and, uh, and that's wasted is, is just is tremendous. And that's what we're seeing in these failed transformations. Yes, definitely. There's a huge amount of waste in, in, in the system, in the way the traditional IT organizations are, are, are organized, definitely. Uh, that's why uh, reducing web, measuring uh, flow efficiency, measuring flow time is so important, right? Uh, usually after the, when the CFO understands that it's, the CFOs are huge partners and this they see the, the, the waste, right? Yeah. Uh, usually when I show uh, this slide about the, the the case, like the business case, they usually freak out. Yeah, I've been yeah. complaining about this for years because they know just doing a business case and not measuring efforts is just a joke, right? They know that that's your theater, right? Everybody knows that, but they don't have the, the tools to do it. So definitely reducing uh, 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 waste in the system, both as just the flow itself and at the same time uh, starting to measure outcomes, it's very something crucial. Right? And understand that this is a journey. You won't get there tomorrow, right? But over time, I mean, when we work teams, every quarter you see things improving. Every quarter you get better and better and better and better. Awesome. Yeah. All right, that is all the time we have for today. Thank you so much, Felipe, for joining us and Mick for your insights. Additionally, if we didn't get to your question, Mick will be answering questions this week in the Task.Flow Flow Framework community, and we'll be working to follow up with all of those that we missed today. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks you so much, Felipe. Thank you, everybody.